peace of Christ be with you. Let us quiet our hearts and our phones, asking the Lord to bless us with his presence this morning. It's great to see everyone this morning. Welcome uh, to worship with us at Bedford Presbyterian Church. Now, for those of you watching from home, know that you're in our thoughts and prayers. And if you have any prayers, praises, or other announcements, please call or email the church office to share those with us. Something more will meet uh, Wednesday at 3 p.m. And of course, if you can't attend, these are also available over the internet through Zoom. So everyone is invited to participate in this ministry of our congregation. Please stand for the call to worship. Come, people of the risen King, sing your songs of joy to the Lord. We tell of God's power and victorious love. Let our voices be heard everywhere. Let our songs of praise never end. Let all the earth echo the songs of God's mighty love. Rejoice, 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 the church of God, rejoice. Our hymn this morning is Come, People of the Risen King.
join together in the prayer of confession. We rejoice in the wonder of your resurrection, O Christ, but then tend to sink back into our old ways of thinking and behaving. We can dance with the angels and all humankind on Easter Sunday, but the days following the day of resurrection cause us to slip back into the apathy or despair. Forgive us when we so easily become distracted by our own cares and worries. Forgive us when we forget your power and love for us. Fill us afresh with your spirit. Set our hearts to dancing. Give us a spirit of rejoicing, willing hearts and hands for helping, voices for praising you forever. Amen. Here now is the assurance of pardon. Sing, shout, rejoice. Jesus calls us into his presence because of his love for us. He believes in you and all the gifts you have been given. Do not be afraid. Christ is with you always. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Through Jesus Christ, we have been born again to new life.
It is a delight to see each and every one of you this morning. And aren't the flowers here today just absolutely gorgeous? Well, we've been making a journey through the scriptures in the book of James within the New Testament. And uh, let's be honest about it. James doesn't cut his fellow believers a lot of slack, does he? <laughs> he lays it on the line. And uh, he's going to be doing that same thing this morning as uh, we move into chapter 5. And uh, I, I'll, uh, I'll share this message from my wife. She said, when are we going to finish this book? <laughs> Well, it won't be too much longer, but even though James can be somewhat stern with us, there's some things to learn as we investigate his message to the early church and to us as well. Good morning, church family. This passage can be found in the New Testament Bible, page 231. Come now, you rich people, weep and wail for the miseries that are coming to you. Your riches have rotted, and your clothes are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have rusted, and their rust will be evidence against you, and it will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure for the last days. Listen. The wages of the laborers who mowed your fields which you kept back by fraud, cry out. And the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the lords of hosts. You have lived on the earth in luxury and in pleasure. You have fattened your hearts on a day of slaughter. You have condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not resist you. The word of the Lord. This hymn, Hallelujah, What a Savior, is a little different than what you have in your hymn book, but it's the, the verses are all the same. So we hope you enjoy it. I would invite you to stand and sing with us.
You may be seated. Indeed, hallelujah, what a savior. We've all heard the story of King Midas. He was a king, supposedly from the country of modern-day Turkey many, many centuries ago, who ruled a, a portion of that land, and he was given a gift by the gods. The gift was that anything he touched would be turned to gold. Well, at first, the gift thrilled him because he loved and passionately pursued wealth. And now it was literally at his fingertips. He went out into the garden, the garden that of the palace was filled with beautiful roses and he touched them and immediately those roses turned into a paradise of gold. He was thrilled. But the thrill of the golden touch soon left him because when he sat down to dinner, everything that he touched turned to gold every morsel that he would eat. And worst of all, when his daughter came running in to greet him and embraced him, she too was turned into a statue of gold. Heartbroken, with a cry of anguish upon his lips, he cried out that the gift would be taken away from him. I don't know whether James was aware of this Greek legend about King Midas, but perhaps he was. For if we turn in our Bibles, and I encourage you to do so this morning, if we turn in our Bibles to the book of James, chapter 5, Beginning with verse 1, we read these words. Now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Sort of sounds like the cries of King Midas when he realized that his touch of gold was not a blessing but a curse. And if you look at the words there, if you pay attention to the two words, weep and wail, that last one, wail, doesn't really grab a hold of the meaning of the Greek word. It's more like a screech of horror. That, that, that wail, that, that cry of despair that we utter when life has turned incredibly terrible unto us. Why would James say this? Now listen, you who stay, uh, and, and now listen, you rich people. Weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. as he proceeds to share with us in the remaining verses of this first section, verses 1 through 6, we'll discover that there are three consequences, three tragic consequences when wealth becomes the gold and the pursuit of our lives when it becomes that which we seek to possess above all other things, there are consequences that begin to transpire and affect our lives and bring us to the point of weeping and wailing. Let's take a look at the first one. Your wealth, he says in verse 2, 
Your wealth has rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their, their corrosion will testify against you and eat your very flesh. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Well, silver and gold doesn't necessarily corrode, or does it? Here's what he's saying to us. <coughs> Wealth doesn't last. Oh, I know that people pursue it, and they think of it as bringing security into their lives. But all too often, the story is just the opposite. I did a little research. And I discovered in my research 14 different individuals who had amassed quite a bit of wealth. Entertainers, sports celebrities, movie stars, and even a film producer. And you know what happened? Each of these individuals lost all of their wealth. It vanished. It disappeared. And even, even more tragically, there was a German businessman, and he had amassed a great deal of wealth, but he'd also amassed a great deal of debt. And that debt began, began to uh, come due. And not only that, just about that same time, 2008 rolled around. Remember the Great Recession that almost became a Great Depression? Well, that hit Germany as well. And he was reduced to being penniless. You know what happened? His pursuit of wealth literally ate his life. Just like, just like James says, their corrosion, the wealth, the pursuit of it will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. He took his own life. And so it came to a tragic den. Proverbs, that little book of wisdom in the Old Testament, has this to say. It's well to remember these two verses in chapter 23. Do not wear yourself out getting rich. Have the wisdom to show restraint. Cast but a glance at riches. Just look at the pursuit and the love of money just a little bit. And they are gone, for they will surely sprout wings and fly off like an eagle. And you know something else? Right along these same lines, wealth doesn't last, and we can't take it with us. I don't know of anyone who has been able to take a sack of gold or a portion of their riches and carry them off into heaven. We might try to bury them with us, but even that won't work. So, wealth doesn't last, sometimes not here on earth, and certainly not with regards to our lives thereafter. Number two, take a look at that next verse. Look, James says, verse four, look, the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields, you know, you, you slighted them, you, you didn't pay them their full wage or maybe didn't give them anything at all, are crying out 
the wages you failed to pay the workmen who mowed your fields are crying out against you. The cries of the harvester of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. He's listening too, and he hears the cries of the depressed, those that are taken advantage of, the poor and the lowly. He hears them. Remember at Christmas time, it comes on the television or perhaps we pull the little volume off our shelves, a Christmas carol. Remember Ebenezer Scrooge and how he pursued wealth with a continual passion. Poor old Bob Cratchit didn't even earn enough to take care of his family. And when he arrived at work, there was only a few little uh, kernels of charcoal or coal to warm the place. You remember that. And how about when the folks arrived the, uh, seeking charities for the poor? And Ebenezer says, let the poor go to the poorhouse or just die. You remember that story. You know what? There are still some Ebenezers in this world today. There are still people, sometimes in positions of great importance and great wealth, who take the light in taking advantage of and squeezing out the last dime from those who are employed by them. James said, don't go there because your heavenly Father is watching. It's a message that is taught, proclaimed, over and over again in God's word from the book of Leviticus right on through the Old Testament, right on through Psalms and Proverbs, right on through the prophets and right on into the New Testament. God's people have an obligation to not let their wealth get in the way of reaching out and being compassionate to others and especially when we are tempted to take advantage of them. Amos. I know a lot of people don't uh, study the book of Amos anymore. It's one of those forgotten prophets of the Old Testament. But uh, he had something to say. He was from Judea in the south, and led by the Lord, he made a journey to the north, and he confronted the people that were living up there, particularly those of great means and prosperity, and he said to them, you know what you're doing? You're cheating people. When, when they come to buy your grain, your scales are weighted in favor of you so that they don't get a, a just amount for their money. And when you do sell them the grain... It is tainted. You've added foreign things in it to dilute it so that it's not really fit to eat. I want you to know, said Amos, that the Lord takes notice of what you're doing and he will bring judgment against you. And if you know the history of the northern kingdom, he did. He carried them away into exile. Paul, writing to Timothy, wanting to encourage him and to teach him about church life and about living and teaching the Christian way of life to others, said this to him. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10. People who want to get rich, people who are pursuing that as the goal of their life, fall into temptation and a trap 
and into many foolish and harmful desires that pledge that plunge rather men into ruin and destruction and then these lines and you've heard these i know for the love of money for the love of money is a root a cause of all kinds of evil so wealth particularly when it's pursued at the expense of others, can make us selfish, can make us turn aside from the needs of others and think only of number one. A second consequence and a tragic one of letting the pursuit of money take charge of our lives. Here's the third one. Wealth can make us lazy. I bet you never thought of that, but this is exactly what he says. You have lived on earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You have fattened yourselves in the day of slaughter. You know what word picture came to mind when I read those words, particularly you have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. <laughs> a group of cattle in a feed pen. And if you know anything about cattle raising, it's the end. That's a bad place to be if you're a cow. James is saying wealth can bring us to the point where we become gluttons of self-indulgence and we're no longer even interested in being industrious anymore. We're sort of like the parable that Jesus told about the rich farmer. I used that illustration last Sunday, I believe. And you know, the rich farmer, he had received so much from his fields and he was going to build bigger barns and so that he could sit back and take it easy, not realizing that that very evening he'd be called before his Father in heaven. <laughs> you know, we live in a day and a time when there are a lot of people, particularly those who have been blessed, have decided that it's time to sit back and take it easy. But there's some real dangers in that. Real dangers for us as individuals and real dangers for us as a nation. Now, I, I see this tendency lived out all too often right here in America. So let me share with you an illustration out of history. In 550 B.C., Cyrus the Great, the king of Persia, moved on the other kingdoms of the Middle East, and he conquered all of them, Babylonia and Egypt. The whole Middle East fell under his sway. Under his leadership, there was a directive that was shared with all of his people and particularly his armies. And here it is. One meal a day. They were to live careful, self-disciplined lives and not let the available luxuries of life get the best of them. And that's one of the reasons why they were so successful on the battlefield, because their enemies lived just the opposite way. Well, two centuries passed, and the Persians began to really enjoy all of the good things that they had conquered. And that, that direction, that theme for the nation, one meal a day, was changed, transformed. It now meant one meal a day that starts at breakfast 
continues to lunch, moves on through to dinner, and finishes up with a snack at midnight. And that became their way of life. And you know what happened? Alexandria, Alexander from Macedonia arrived on the scene. He only had, in comparison to the Persians, a small army. <laughs> Nevertheless, when he attacked, they fled, and in short order, someone who could and should have been easily vanquished became the new supreme ruler of all of the Middle East, and the Persians were vanquished. Hmm. What happens to a nation, even a strong nation, even a nation with lots of planes and lots of ships, and who has a record from the past of being self-disciplined, what happens when it decides to go down the road to living in the lap of luxury? The same thing can happen to that nation as it happened to Persia. The same thing can happen to this nation as it did to Persia. So, yes, there are some consequences when wealth becomes the single goal of life. And sometimes the consequences can be just like Midas's touch. The wealth that we pursue can flee from us and can turn us into selfish, self-centered kinds of people and it can make us lazy. That's why, in conclusion, let's look at this last verse. Number six. James says, you have condemned and murdered the innocent, righteous man. You have condemned and murdered the righteous one who does not resist you. Now, he's been talking about the rich oppressing the poor. That's plural because there's more than one of them. Who is he talking about here? Who is the subject of the one man, the one who did not resist you? Who is he? William Barclay, in his commentary, shared a thought, an impression, that I will share with you today. He said, the one who did not resist you is the same one who said, the same one who said, as you have done unto one of the least of these. Chapter 25, Gospel of Matthew as you have done unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done unto me. Who is the one? I think the one is the Lord Jesus Christ, who did not resist those who took his life when he stood before them and was condemned and then crucified. You know the scriptures in the book of Isaiah it says he opened not his mouth like a lamb being taken to the slaughter. That is the one that those who pursue wealth and nothing more are really, in fact, crucifying all over again. The one who, like Midas' daughter, was most precious, the one who was most precious to them, their Savior, is the very one who is going to the cross because they 
were willing to use their wealth in ways that so displeased our God in heaven. May we, and I believe so, may we, because I think I know you well enough, may, may we never find ourselves in the company of the rich who oppress, but rather let us find ourselves, even on today with the offering of food that is taken on the second Sunday, let us this day be those who reach out in Christ's name, sharing with others, those who were genuinely in need, sharing with them the bounty of our hand. Let's take to heart what James had to say to his people today. Let's pray. Gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, it is easy to forget about a world of need because in the eyes, well, in, the, in comparing ourselves to the rest of the world, we're all very well off, very well off. Help us never to end up being like Mr. Ebenezer, but rather just the opposite. Let's be like him after he was reformed, after he discovered the joy of living and sharing and giving. Let us be the kind of people who rejoice in sharing with others the bounty that you have bestowed upon us beginning with a relationship with your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we do pray. Amen. If I were to summarize today's scripture passage in one sentence, in fact, I could probably summarize the entire book of James in this one sentence. We need to be like Jesus. The Lord said, What do I require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with my God? I want to be like you, Lord. I want like you for you are marvelous in all of your ways. I want to give like you, Lord. I want to live in you for you have showered me with mercy every day.
would you stand and sing that with us? We want to be like Jesus. We want to be like you, Lord. We want to love like you for you. Our marvelous in all of your Let's affirm our faith together. This is the gospel that we have received, in which we stand, and by which we are saved. If we hold it fast, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter and the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. Praise God for Despite the persistence of evil, now is always the time when more good can be done and we can make a difference. May it be so through the offering of these gifts and the offering of our lives. Amen. Be seated. As we now share with one another the joys and the concerns that are upon our hearts, let me begin by sharing two, uh, really, really three. We've all heard, if you turned on the television last night, about the conflict in Israel between that country and Iran and how it could very easily escalate into uh, a whole Middle Eastern war. That's certainly a concern that God's people should be praying about. But we sometimes forget that there's another war going on that's just as grievous and in some ways even more so. The conflict that was initiated by Russia when it invaded Ukraine and that continues. And the Ukrainians are running out of the means to defend themselves. And if countries like the United States don't help them, 
Russia could easily win and take over that land. I've shared this with you before, but between Adolf Hitler and Joseph Stalin in the 1930s and 40s, they lost one half of their entire population, 20 million people. <laughs> They're not anxious to return to that kind of subjugation by an outside foreign power. They want to be free and deserve to be free. There are conflicts taking place in other locations around our globe as well. Shuri and I give to the Samaritan's Purse, and I received word just this week that starvation is now a growing problem, a fact of life in the country of Sudan. Those northern African nations, a whole number of them, are in turmoil, and Sudan, uh, right now there is civil war, and thousands of innocent people are going hungry because people are fighting. Different factions are fighting with one another. We seem to have a hard time. <laughs> Human beings seem to have a hard time living in peace with one another. And, and it seems to be a growing fact of life in our world today. So that's certainly a matter of great prayer and concern on my heart and I hope on yours. Now, let us share in the other concerns that the Lord has laid upon your hearts. Well, a year ago, I was very blessed with a great-grandson, and just a few days ago, I was blessed with a great-granddaughter. Mia Rose Matilski is on the earth and going to be a great Christian, I'm sure. Wonderful. A birth is always something to rejoice in. I remember years ago in, when I was a chaplain, there was a, a grandmother, and she was literally jumping off the walls on either side <laughs> as she rejoiced in the birth of a grandchild, and she was just so excited, just like you. Wonderful. Other prayer concerns? Joys? Christy? just had recent surgery on her ear and now she's going to have to go back because they didn't get it all. I, I think it's melanoma. But um, we pray for Rosalind Reynolds. And she has been a cheerleader for our garden club. And our garden club's fundraiser is this Friday and I'm afraid that we're not going to have people come because she would go out on the streets and just sell tickets like crazy. So I have a few tickets for our fundraiser this Friday if you're interested. Our lunch is at Avenel from I think 11 to 2, we will have prizes and hanging baskets as well as a delicious lunch. So please come out Friday to Avenel and support the Garden Club. Thanks. Let's go to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Dear gracious Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you clearly acknowledging that our world is in turmoil. And we, we listen to the news and we hear the reports and there are bad things happening in Israel, in Ukraine, in Sudan, and in lots of other places as well. Lord, bring peace to our troubled world. People, help, help people to learn how to live in harmony one with another instead of taking up arms in conflict. Lord, uh, we rejoice when a a new granddaughter, a new grandson makes his or her way into our lives. And we thank you for those wonderful times that we can rejoice 
in the birth of those little children that we now can entrust into your care and ask that you bless them and keep them. Lord Jesus, uh, we, we give thanks for all of the good things that happen right around us right here, as well as praying for those who are experiencing troubles and surgeries and special needs. Father, hear our prayers, our requests, answer them, and teach us, Lord, to stay in contact with you just as you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As we conclude our time of worship together today, we're going to stand. Yes, Venus. Yes, I want to make an announcement. Our cancer group is meeting this Thursday, and we do have a speaker, and he's on about nutrition. And anybody who's a diabetic, please come too. All right. For those who have faced cancer and for those who uh, deal with diabetes, the meeting on Thursday, what time? Six o'clock. Six o'clock here in the fellowship hall. Get the word out to others that might be interested and be uh, desirous of coming. All right, now let's stand and sing, Oh God, you call for justice.
May we always remember that our true wealth resides not here on earth, but in heaven, in a Savior who gave his life for us that we might live with him forever. Amen? Amen. 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 for getting my attention. <laughs> William, take care. Bill, God bless. Glad we can make that announcement. Paul. <laughs> huh? The politicians are greedy. <laughs> <laughs>